All right, well, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining. This is the third of our um, SPR uh, sort of dissertation presentation webinars. And um, for those of you who are interested not only in uh, hearing these webinars, but possibly in presenting, please you know, keep in mind that this is an option available to SPR members. And, and is a really neat way to uh, reach out and collaborate with other people uh, and just spread some, uh, some interest about something that, you know, presumably is pretty important to you. Uh, you know, I know my dissertation is certainly something that I, that I, you know, feel very strongly about. And so it's a nice way to, to share some of that work um, at a time in our careers when we might not get a lot of opportunities to do that sort of thing. So just a little plug, if you guys are, you know, you're thinking about it, uh, we are definitely looking for other students to present their dissertations uh, as part of this series. So what I, what I want to do today is, is run through a, a bunch of slides. Uh, and, and the first half of the, the slideshow is actually not on my dissertation. It's on some other work. Uh, but I think it's really important to set the stage for this. And, and I'm going to talk from a, a pretty pragmatic perspective in that um, you know, my current position is as a research fellow at a health services research and development site located at one of the um, biggest U.S. Veterans Administration hospitals. And uh, one of the things that is, is going on in the United States is that we're having a, a big change in the way we think about compensation and payment for medical and mental health services. And one of the really important factors for figuring out how we compensate is understanding uh, how much a particular cure, and, and I would put that in quotes, uh, should cost. So one of the pressures that's coming, and it's, and it's currently much more felt in the medical field, but it's coming for mental health. Is, is the idea of how to risk adjust for a particular type of care. And what that, what that means basically is that you know, insurance companies, hospitals, all acknowledge that not all patients are created equal. And that it's really important to be able to model differences between patients, between the types of problems that patients might have, uh, in order to be able to correctly identify how much, on average, a particular treatment should cost. Uh, and this is really important because the fee-for-service model, the you know, sort of paying session by session, that model is, is probably going away, and it's probably going to be replaced with something else. And what that is right now is largely unknown. And clinical psychologists don't play a very big role in the national conversation, at least in the United States, uh, about what kind of compensation models we should have and how we should be thinking about patient care and patient problems. So you know, I, I, I say all this to sort of present some context for this. In my, in my opinion and in my experience, there's actually a sense of urgency about this kind of research that you know, we really don't know much about how to, how to adjust our expectations for how long a treatment should take based on patient characteristics. Similarly, we don't necessarily know whether referring somebody to one provider versus another is going to be more or less effective. Um, and, and we don't know exactly what to expect in terms of how people ought to change during treatment. And these are all really important questions that, that you know, certain aspects of our field have been trying to address uh, for decades. And so you know, what I want to talk about today is, is sort of one, one part of that you know, sort of research, which is really based on, on sort of the, the principles that I've sort of laid out in this slide. It really starts with, with uh, Kiesler's patient uniformity myth, which is you know, basically the, the sort of declaration that it's kind of ridiculous to pretend that all patients are the same. Therefore, when we aggregate across patients, we should be very, very careful about what kind of aggregation we're doing. And this is a big part of the, the sort of the driver for uh, the sort of the gold standard, the RCT, 
in that, you know, what an RCT tries to do is it tries to ensure a homogeneous patient population so as to, to sort of control for that inherent heterogeneity in patients. Um, and, and, you know, what's, what's largely happened recently is that with the sort of increase in ability to conduct effectiveness research, which is research done outside of a controlled setting in a natural setting, uh, one of the things that people have tried to do increasingly is to model that, uh, that heterogeneity rather than control for it, since you can't do that in a naturalistic setting. Um, so moving forward, uh, you know, one of the things that, that researchers are increasingly trying to do is, is instead of aggregating across patients, trying to figure out places where you can carve out, you know, sort of types of patients. Or if you're looking on a more continuous, you know, spectrum, uh, what continuous variables meaningfully help us differentiate between different types of patients? Um, and so, you know, largely, the, the purpose of this is to sort of address some of, you know, the, the research that's gone towards trying to shift us away from this assumption that all patients should be treated equally, that all therapists should be treated equally, and that we should expect the same response to therapy given a particular dose. All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to start with that one. Uh, which sort of you know, brings me, I'm just really quickly going to cover some of this because I want to set the stage for, for sort of what I see as, as a certain amount of urgency uh, in the need for clinical psychologists to be doing more research in this domain and to be more vocal about what our research findings are because if we don't do it and if we don't uh, get vocal about this, what's going to happen is that medical doctors, um, and, and other administrators and people who are closer to the organizational level of decision making are going to make these decisions for us. And, and I would argue, I have argued, that we're in a much better position to actually make these, these recommendations. Um, so just really quickly, um, this is the, the, the sort of the classic treatment for depression collaborative research program uh, or project, I think it was, uh, you know, sort of compared uh, a couple of different sort of frontline treatments uh, against amipramine, uh, which was a, a frontline drug treatment of the time, uh, and looking for you know differences in uh, in treatment type. And you can you know it's a classic classic series of studies. Um, interestingly, uh, Wolfgang Lutz and his colleagues went back to that data, and and what they did was they asked you know is it is it best to sort of model change in this you know change over time as a single trajectory. Or is it more effective if we uh, actually model change over time as multiple trajectories? And, and what they found was that you know, models fit the data much, much better if you, if you allow the models to converge to multiple trajectories of change. Uh, and you see sort of these two high symptom trajectories, both pretty much starting treatment at about the same place, but with pretty markedly different uh, trajectories. And, um, and, and so in, replic in attempting to replicate that, we found a very similar pattern of change um, on depression scores in a, in a clinic at Penn State. Um, and, and one of the really important things about this is that it indicates that, you know, just symptoms at, at session one probably aren't enough to really tell us about differences between patients, or at least differences, this is on a depression score, differences in sort of depression score look like they're probably not enough to really explain differences in how we could expect patients to respond. So we actually asked that question. We tried to use other variables that we had to predict membership in either the rapid responding group or the, the sort of very, very slow responding group. Um, and what we found was that uh, if you look at these predictors, you find that increased social conflict, suicidality, and reduced sexual functioning, these are all self-reported, uh, predicted membership in that non-responding group, whereas increased interpersonal hostility predicted membership in the rapidly responding group. So there, there, there are two things that we've sort of preliminarily hypothesized to explain this. One is that um, it's been found in some uh, microprocess research that uh, clients in therapy who have more overt hostility tend to talk about the stuff that they need to be working on much better than clients without overt hostility. 
Right, so the idea is that a hostile person or an angry person will walk into a session and they will talk about the things that are bothering them. And that will give the, the therapist a real opportunity to help them work on those things. Uh, and so it may be creating a sort of a micro process whereby, uh, you know, it sort of facilitates treatment that works on the things that need to be worked on. Um, in terms of predicting membership in that, in that sort of slow responding group, um, you know, increased social conflict and suicidality and, and reduced sexual functioning may be indications of uh, sort of increased functional impairment, meaning, you know, not only are they symptomatically distressed, but that their distress is also either creating or the result of real impairment in, that, that spreads beyond just being depressed, right? Maybe, maybe you don't have a lot of friends. Maybe your relationship isn't as solid as you would like it to be. Uh, and maybe you've lost some hope. Maybe you're, you're considering, uh, you know, killing yourself. An another idea is maybe that suicidality, um, if, it's, if it's sort of bad enough, would really sort of take over the treatment and you wouldn't be able to deliver a treatment for depression uh, while you're working on managing someone's active suicidality. I mean, these are all hypotheses about, about what might be going on. Uh, but, but what I really want sort of the takeaway to be here is that patients don't respond the same way in treatment even when we account for their initial symptom severity unless what we start to do is account for a multidimensional severity, right? So not just measuring depression, but measuring perhaps, you know, multiple domains of distress and functional impairment so that we really start to capture the, the fullness of what it means to be, uh, you know, that particular client. I'd also say that, you know, one of the things that could, could also be really helpful is instead of just collecting information at intake, collecting information across the first couple of sessions at the very least might help us to see whether somebody is rapidly responding to the treatment or whether they seem to be really stuck. Uh, and other work that Wolfgang Lutz and his lab have done has shown that, that early change in treatment predicts overall change um, and may be another promising mechanism for, for developing a better understanding of differences between patients. So just quickly moving on to therapists, um, uh, Kim Wampold and Bolt reanalyzed the, the same TDCRP data, um, but at this time they looked for uh, therapist effects. So they used multi-level modeling, uh, and they tried to account for the variation attributable to therapists. And they found that overall it accounted for about 7% of the variation in outcome, while once they accounted for differences uh, between therapists, uh, none of the, the variation in outcome was attributable to the treatment orientation of choice. And not only that, but they found an indication that with higher levels of depression, the therapist mattered even more that more of the variation in outcome was attributable to the therapist, the higher the degree of depression, indicating perhaps that the person of the therapist is more important the more severe the patient gets. Um, we did some similar work where, where we tried to look at whether different therapists were better or worse with different kinds of patients. Um, and I, I'm just going to mention this very quickly and, that, and then move on to a, a more specific example. Um, because I think that this is another place where, where there may be a real opportunity for us to do some um, client matching, uh, where, where particular therapists may have particular domains of expertise and that, and that you know, we may be able to identify those domains of expertise, refer according to those domains of expertise, uh, and, and find, uh, find ourselves with a, a a better effect size for treatment since we're matching, uh, you know, sort of already effective therapists with a particular problem type. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to gloss over this because I, I want to make sure I have ample time to get to the the, the bulk of this. Um, but we took a, a pretty big sample of, uh, of of clients and 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 a pretty special sample it was it was a sample of um, of therapists really who had five clients with unipolar depression, right? So they just had uh, a major depressive disorder and, and nothing else that they were really reporting at intake. And then they had at least five clients who had major depression and co-occurring substance use problems. Um, and so when we, when we made that selection, we found a sample of 37 therapists who had at least five clients in each of those groups. Um, 
And what we did was we ranked those therapists first based on their, um, their residualized gain scores, which can account for initial severity, uh, and then also by uh, a hierarchical linear model, a multi-level model uh, slope, and then compared across methods just because we wanted to be, be sure that we were ranking them in a, in a way that made sense and a way that we can defend, uh, and found that the rankings were, were you know, virtually identical. Uh, and what we did was we, we then, we, so we ranked for simple depression, and then we ranked again for depression co-occurring with substance use. Um, just to sort of do an observational uh, study on, on looking at whether those rankings held up. If you're really good with, with depression, are you also really good with depression when there's co-occurring substance use? And what we found was that if we pulled out the best therapists with simple depression, and we compared them to the best therapists with depression and co-occurring substance use. We first of all found that only three of, uh, no, no, only two of ten therapists uh, were the same. So the, the rankings basically indicated that the top uh, therapists who were good with simple depression were not the top therapists who were good with uh, simple depression and co-occurring substance use. Um, but what this slide indicates is, is something that I found really interesting, which is if you're good with substance use, you're almost equally as good as the best therapists with simple depression uh, when it comes to handling simple depression. So let me explain it again. This is showing only change for clients with simple depression. The red line is, is therapists who are the best at treating simple depression. And the blue line is the therapists who are the best at treating simple depression, when it, not simple depression, but depression when it co-occurs with substance use. And what you can see here is that while the red line, the therapists who are the best with simple depression, is a little bit steeper, the difference here really is clinically meaningless. If we switch over and we compare these two groups when it comes to co-occurring substance use, what we see is something actually quite different. Whoops, let me go back a slide. Okay. So here, the blue line, again, is the therapists who are the best with major depression and substance use. The red line is the therapists who are best with the simple depression, and this is now treating people with major depression and co-occurring substance use. And what you see here is you see a, a really good size effect size difference. You know, both therapists are effective, right? I mean, both, you know, the, even, the, even the, the red line is achieving about, a, you know, a little bit more than a standard deviation of, of change. Um, but what we see is we see a really meaningful difference between performance here, indicating that if you have somebody with co-occurring with depression and co-occurring substance use, it really matters who you pick as a therapist. Whereas if you're somebody who just has simple depression, it may not matter that much. Um, and that's really important. That's actionable. Uh, that's actionable intelligence. That's stuff that we can make treatment recommendations on. We can make organizational recommendations on. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip this slide because, again, I, I want to make sure I have enough, enough time for this. So here is where uh, my dissertation comes in. Um, basically, the, the dissertation was sort of predicated on this idea that we, we really need to be thinking about how we capture heterogeneity between clients. This goes back to, you know, sort of that, that first study I showed where we looked at people who at intake, you know, looked very similar on a measure of depression. And yet that measure of depression was really unable to predict what kind of change they would have in treatment. And so, you know, what I wanted to explore was whether or not it would be possible to model uh, the heterogeneity between clients in such a way that we could extract groups of people who are relatively homogenous that we could then use to meaningly predict things like treatment outcome, like diagnosis. I mean, basically, the, the idea is to, is to sort of build a heuristic that, that can help us use data to inform how we practice. And not just how we practice, but also could help a, you know, a, a manager or a, a clinic administrator or a clinic director make decisions about how they balance caseloads, um, what kinds of you know, problems they expect for different types of patients, um, 
and, and to be honest, when I started this, I really didn't know, you know, all of the, the potential ramifications for this, this work. So let me, just, let me just dive right into it and, um, you know, punch in your questions if you have them, you know, raise hands, and I'm, you know, I'm happy to slow down, you know, here and, uh, and take some time to really, you know, sort of dig into this piece. So the dissertation consisted of four studies. Um, uh, exploratory and confirmatory latent profile analyses, and I'll, I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, and then uh, an examination of uh, predicting diagnosis, and then an examination of predicting change over time in treatment. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip over that. Um, okay. So the data. We had awesome data. So the, the data comes from uh, an organization that's run out of Penn State, but that, that crosses over many, many different um, counseling centers, college counseling centers in the United States. Uh, the organization is called the Center for Collegiate Mental Health. And uh, basically what it does now is uh, it has organized college counseling centers to use the same well-validated measure of psychological symptoms and to share their data via IRB approval with the Center for Collegiate Mental Health. So every year CCMH collects data on roughly 80 to 100,000 students in, in treatment. The, the data for the first study uh, was about 20,000 students from over 50 different colleges and universities. Uh, this was the pilot data, believe it or not, from the, the Center for Collegiate Mental Health. This was the first data that we, uh, that we collected. Um, the CCAF 62 has been extremely well validated. Um, there are a number of publications that you can find uh, discussing the factor structure and, and validity of the, of the measure. Um, it's a 62 item questionnaire, breaks out into eight different subscales. I've got them listed there. I'll talk about them a lot as we, as we go forward, so plenty of time to see those more frequently. Uh, and then the, the CCAF is accompanied by a standardized data set. Uh, which is basically a, a, a standardized set of, of demographic and psychosocial questions that we recommend uh, be administered alongside the instrument, but do not require. So colleges can choose how they, how they sort of ta tailor it, um, but there's a core group of questions that are included uh, pretty much automatically, and those were established by consensus. Um, from a bunch of different uh, college counsel center, counseling center directors who are on the board of advisors. Um, so latent profile analysis, right? So uh, latent profile analysis is a, uh, a method of analysis that basically attempts to explain the variation uh, between people by extracting groups of people. So the idea is that if the, uh, if the method can correctly pull out all the meaningful groups or profiles of, of subjects, it will have explained all of the covariation in the, with, between subjects. That's the idea. So, so essentially what this is going to do is it's going to ask the question, uh, you know, are there groups of people who are reporting similarly on the CCAPs? And by modeling those groups, do we do a better job of explaining the structure of the data than if we don't model those groups? And the way you build a, a latent profile analysis is that you start with a one class model, which is essentially just modeling the, uh, the means for the sample, right? Because one group will have, you know, the, the, it'll have the global means. And then you build a second class. And you ask, you know, does including this second class improve the model fit? And then you add a third class, and you keep going and going and going. Um, we, I determined a priori that what we would do is we would stop after finding a class that represented less than 1% of the total sample. Um, and the reason I, I, I determined that was because given the sample size, it was likely that we were going to be able to pull a lot, a lot, a lot of classes. And so we needed to have some kind of an artificial stopping point just to save us from having, you know, to explain 40 classes or 30 classes or something like that. Um, and so um, 
a 17 class model was the was the best fit for the data uh, with the caveat that an 18 class model was actually a better fit but the 18th class represented less than 1% of the total sample uh, so we stopped at 17 classes and here's what it looks like ah, uh, you can't make any sense of this and that's okay but I will point out a couple of things that that do seem important so going from left to right the subscales are depression, generalized anxiety, academic distress, social anxiety, family distress, eating concerns, substance use, and hostility. And what I want to point out initially is that if you look at the left side of that, of that graph, what you will see is that the, the lines, so each different colored line represents a different class. Right? And the relative the elevations represent that class's mean on the particular subscales. And what you'll note is that if you look at the, the, the subscales on the left, depression, generalized anxiety, academic distress, social anxiety in particular, what you'll see is those lines are roughly parallel. And one of the important takeaways about that is that that may be indicating that those particular subscales basically capture a continuous uh, you know, sort of construct that might be associated with something like distress or negative affectivity or something like that. But that they don't really offer us a lot in differentiating between different types of, of patient. Basically what, what the left side of the graph says is that, you know, not surprisingly, clients are differentiated by their uh, you know, by where they are on a continuous distribution that has something to do with how distressed they are. Uh, so that's not a big surprise. When you look at the right side, however, what you see is a mess. And we want that mess because what that mess is saying is that over here, when it comes to uh, particularly to eating concerns, substance use, and reported hostility, that uh, there's meaningful, meaningful differences between these classes that are not uh, continuously distributed. And, and that's helpful, that's, that's promising. Um, and um, if you have questions, just, you know, just fire them in, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going uh, until, I get, uh, until I get questions. Okay? So, so that was study one. Right? And study two, the purpose of study two was to see whether study one actually replicated. Right? Because it, these results are meaningless if they are uh, if, they're, if they vary between samples, if they're not stable, uh, you know, these classes are completely unhelpful unless they represent real reporting styles that appear to be driven by real underlying things, right, or real underlying, I hesitate to call them constructs because it's important to be really careful with these types of analysis uh, not, to, not to glorify these things. Right? I mean, it, just to take us back again, you know, if, if our results were only um, on the left side of that graph, if our results only came from the depression, anxiety, academic distress, and social anxiety scales, right, what that would basically be telling us is that this method is, is not helpful because all we're doing is we're, cat we're basically binning people into, you know, different, different quartiles or in, in this place, you know, deciles or 17th aisles or whatever. Um, and that we might as well just model it as a continuous distribution, right? But then when we look at the right side of the chart, what it says is, no, 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 you know, th there are really important differences that may be better expressed as, you know, meaningful categories, right? So, so the question is, does this, does this structure replicate? And it's hard to tell from here, but don't worry. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make it more explicit. So what I basically did was, I matched up the profiles. I looked at them, I got really familiar with them, and I said, okay, well this one looks like this one, and this one looks like this one, and this one looks like this one, and I started to match them up. And 16 of the 17 matched up. Um, and so I'm going to show you. So uh, each of these graphs uh, shows, laid on top of one another, the, uh, the results from the exploratory, those are the solid line, and the confirmatory analyses. Okay? And, and what it really you know, indicates, and, and I like doing this graphically, I, can all, I, you know, I also did it using effect size statistics, but that, that the, the two forms of analysis basically are extracting the same classes. 
and, and you know you can think of these as two you know, it's similar to like two exploratory factor analyses that find the same factor structure in an instrument over two different samples. What it's basically saying is that these things probably don't vary, that these are probably, you know, sort of legitimate real ways of, of capturing distress. You'll see down, at, if you look at number six, eating concerns and substance use, you'll see a little bit of a discrepancy there. Um, the reason for that is that for one of these uh, analyses, uh, one of the classes that was extracted was actually a more severe version of this. So there was high, they were even higher on the eating and the substance use. And, and, and when that class was extracted, what happened was it pulled out some of the people that in this class bring the, the mean up uh, and, and brought the mean for the confirmatory one down. Um, but we decided that these were we, is, were still matched and that they really had the same they were reporting the same patterns of distress um, and that that's really what we were what we were going after was the, were these patterns okay, and just and just to sort of run through right so you've got you know I use mild moderate distress and then I use sort of you know low mild moderate severe uh, in terms of the substance use. Right? So if you look at classes one and two, they're basically capturing the same thing. Right? These are people who are coming in, they're reporting below average distress, uh, and then they're reporting uh, you know, uh, significant elevations in, in substance use. And these, by the way, are, re are reported in, in standardized these are z scores. So uh, every, every one point move is a standard deviation above the, uh, the clinical average, the clinical norm. Sam? So I noticed that we have a hand raised. Yes, I was going to say that. Uh, we do have a hand raised. Um, Alejandra, I think. I opened up your microphone. Hi, Alejandra. Do you want to, uh, if you uh, have a mic, you can ask your question out loud. If you don't have a mic, feel free to type it. Okay, so I'll, I'll just keep going and we'll see if... Uh, oh, it's coming uh, okay. in. Okay, how Ready? big is each of the groups? Which is a really good question. Uh, although I don't think that's the one from Alejandra. No, it's from uh, Rosh Bailey. Uh, okay, so that, that is a great question. And, um, God, you know, I don't think I put that slide on here. Um, but so here's what I will say is that um, the groups vary in size. I'll show you the biggest groups were, if you look at number 10 and number 7, remember that these are college students. Those were the two biggest groups. Together those counted for about 25% of the total respondents. Um, and, and what was really neat about, about looking at these forms of analysis was I also compared group sizes, right? So, so if, the, if the structure of these things is consistent, then not only should the, the mean structure be the same, but they should also capture roughly the same proportion of the total sample. And that was, that was very, very strongly confirmed in these analyses. Um, so, for example, if you look at the top right, if you look at number 17, undifferentiated severe, that was, that was about 1.7% uh, of, the, of the sample in both cases, right? So uh, the groups really varied. You know, the nice thing about having 20,000, uh, you know, uh, a sample of 20,000 to start with is that even when they were very small, they, they were still in the hundreds. Um, so, so these results are relatively stable. Um, so I, I just want to run through a couple of, of sort of more detailed examples, right? So, uh, oh, and here I report the size. Yes, oh, good for me, okay. So this is uh, a simple major depression profile. Um, you see that they're, you know, they're elevated on, on all of the distress uh, indicators to the left. Um, they've got some family distress, and then they've got a lot of hostility. And that actually fits pretty well with, uh, with some models of depression, right? The depression can often either create a lot of anger or it can be anger turned inward. Um, or that people can grow so frustrated that they express a fair amount of anger and hostility. Um, this, I, I here call adjustment in significant substance use. This accounted for somewhere between two and two and a half percent. 
like I said, this one's severely distressed and in crisis, about 1.7%. Uh, substance use and eating problems is about 2%. Um, and so the other, the other important part of, of study two was to really try and sort of validate these. You would expect that if these different reporting styles are actually capturing underlying constructs. What you would expect is you would expect to see some other indications of differences between these groups, right? You wouldn't just want to see the same demographics for all the groups. You wouldn't want to see the same socio or psychosocial reported uh, sort of history and stuff like that. And so, you know, we looked a lot at that stuff. Right? And so if you look at gender, for example, what you see is that, uh, not surprisingly, that eating and substance use group uh, is dominated by women. Right? So that the likelihood of, of being in that group and being a woman uh, goes up pretty dramatically. Um, and, and these percentages are displayed as an increase or a decrease from the base rate. Right? So what that basically says is if you look at eating and substance use, um, there's a there's a 50 percent on average decrease in the likelihood of being male, right? And there's like a 30 percent increase in the likelihood of being female and being in that group, right? And that's reversed if you look at the adjustment and significant substance use group, right? You're much more likely to be male. You're much less likely to be female, right? So so what, again, what we're seeing is that we're seeing these consistent, right? We wanted these things to be consistent. Uh, across the samples, uh, you're seeing these very consistent changes in, in demographics. Uh, if you look at ethnicity, this is where I, I just, I love this stuff, right? So we, we look at uh, ethnicity and you look at the, the incidence of uh, reporting uh, um, ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic uh, uh, culture and, and identity. Um, what you see is, I want to I go back really quickly to the family and identity. Okay. So if you look at the bottom right, that's the family conflict and hostility profile, right? So you're just, you're basically average on everything, then you spike a little, you spike on family and you spike a lot on hostility. And if we, we come back down, what we see is that the likelihood of being African American is, is almost double. Um, and then the likelihood of being Asian is up, the likelihood of being Hispanic is up, and the likelihood of being white is down, right? Whereas that eating and substance use, the adjustment and substance use uh, profiles, the likelihood of being white is much higher than it is, you know, just overall. So again, you know, one of the things that's really neat about this is that we haven't, we haven't modeled any of this, right? We only modeled symptoms. We didn't model race and ethnicity. And what this is telling us is that those profiles are consistently in some way or form being driven by or somehow capturing differences in ethnicity. Um, and, and because this is sort of a data-driven process, you know, what this does is it starts to generate ideas about hypotheses we might want to test in the future. Um, and it also gives us, you know, sort of meaningful, helpful, descriptive data. You know, that, that if somebody comes in and they report distress in a particular way, uh, that it, there may be some kind of cultural bound to the way that they're responding that we might need to be aware of. Um, so, you know, I want to qu just quickly jump in and sort of say, you know, why, why is this important? Like, why do we want to model, you know, all of these different dimensions? And, and what I would offer is that if you look at these two profiles, um, which is, you know, the bottom one is the, the, the sort of depressed uh, with hostility. The top one is the, the most severe group, right? That's the 1.7% uh, group, which I called undifferentiated severe or severe in crisis. Um, and you look just at their scores on the left, right? Depression, anxiety, academic distress, social anxiety, family distress. Those are things we measure all the time, right? Like if you're using a PHQ-9, that's all you're getting. And they look pretty much identical, you know? But when you capture them across these other domains, why does that matter? It matters because that, the blue group is twice as likely to have reported past self-harm, and it's twice as likely to have reported harming other people in the past. So by, by capturing you know, differences across these multiple domains, what you're starting to do 
is, is really model meaningful differences that can offer us some predictive value in terms of, of really sort of determining what people are, are likely to come in having problems with or, or what, at least as a clinician, we need to be thinking about, we need to be aware of. Um, I, okay, so sociodemographic stuff. Just really, really quick. This slide's a little bit too big, but you should be able to see some of these things. So profiles 11 and 13, don't worry, I'm going to pull them in, uh, right? Uh, what we see is if we're looking at, uh, where are we looking? So we're looking at, oh, no, my things are off. Okay. So what we really want to see here is uh, that, that harmed another uh, statistic, which is, which is sort of down at the bottom. Uh, and you can't even see the confirmatory one. But what's, what's really important about, about this is that there's some indication that there may be some, uh, some internalizing, externalizing, and we're not even, yeah, we're not even getting some of the stuff that I really wanted. That's a bummer. Uh, I may have to skip over these slides. But basically the, the takeaway from this is actually that uh, another thing that's really helpful uh, to sort of capture between these Oops, is this working? Yeah, okay, wait, let me go back. So I think this one, no, that one's not okay either. Darn it. All right, well, I'll have to come back to this. But the, the idea basically is that, you know, by capturing these multiple domains of distress, we're also getting at really other really important stuff, like um, how likely people are to uh, have harmed other people, how likely they are to have a history of harming themselves. Um, and what that can really offer us is a great way to go to clinicians and say, hey, based on the way this person's reporting, you might really want to check this out. Um, and it can improve our ability, I think, to, to sort of proactively go after things that, that might you know, help clinicians uh, do a better job. All right, so the purpose of study three was to look at uh, diagnosis and to really see whether we're able to predict diagnosis using these, these profiles. Um, data is 3,200 students in two uh, universities that, that offered us their diagnostic data. Uh, and, you know, here's what we, uh, what we get. So this is the overall, these are the overall percentages. So um, if you look at that alcohol and significant substance use profile, what you see is that three quarters of them got a diagnosis of an alcohol use problem. Right? So it makes sense. Um, what I report here is I report the, 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 uh, the multiple of the base rate, right? So here we look down adjustment in significant substance use. They're 5.4 5 times more likely to have an alcohol use disorder diagnosis, right? We look at the eating ones, 7 and, and almost 12 times likelihood of, of getting a diagnosis of anorexia or bulimia, right? Um, and then simple major depressive disorder, uh, 2.5 times more likely to get depression. In crisis, three times more likely to get a depression diagnosis, 5.5 times more likely to get a personality disorder, 13 times more likely to get a schizophrenia diagnosis. Right? So part of what these things are indicating is that they may be capturing things that we do tie to other categories that we use, namely diagnosis. Right? So how can this be helpful, right? This is really neat. I want to highlight this. If you look at the differences between the adjustment and significant substance use and the in-crisis group, you'll see that the in-crisis group has two times the base rate of alcohol use disorder diagnosis, and that the, the other group has five and a half times the base rate of diagnosis, right? Let's look at the profiles. Huh. So the profile with higher substance use is actually the, uh, the um, what I would call the in-crisis or the severe undifferentiated group. They're in fact about half a standard deviation higher than the group that three quarters get diagnosed with substance use. So why is that important? Well, because if you actually look at the sociodemographic data, 80% of the people on each profile say that they're concerned about their alcohol use. But the diagnostics say that you know the people who are in the uh, the brown in the in the um, severe substance use profile uh, are the ones with a substance use problem, even though the other people are reporting more. This is really helpful because 
the reason I think this is happening is because the people in the red group are coming in and they're reporting distress across the board. You know, they're probably suicidal. They're probably very angry. They probably have eating problems. They probably have problems with their family. They're probably not doing great overall. My guess is that that overwhelms a clinician's ability to assess it in a brief period of time, and it makes it really hard to tease out the substance use problem. Whereas the brown group basically is coming in and they're saying everything's fine except I, do, I drink a lot or I use a lot of substances. And so it's easy to identify them. So the idea is that what these data-driven heuristics can offer is a, a, second, a second way for clinicians to get really meaningful and helpful information about what's going on with their clients. Also, to tie it in with sort of what I was talking about at the very beginning of this, these also probably offer us a pretty good way of looking at the number of problems that somebody is likely to have. Right? So somebody in the brown group comes in, and we can basically say, this, pro this person probably has a primary substance use problem. And you know, if their profile changes over time and more depression or anxiety emerges as the substance use goes down, then maybe what we can say is, okay, it looks like the substance use is masking that other problem. Whereas that top group, what we can say is they've, they've got some substance use problems, but it's not masking. If it's masking anything, then these guys are really in a lot of trouble because they've got distress across the board and they probably have multiple comorbidities. Uh, and these people probably are going to take more, more time to treat. They're going to be possibly more complicated, more difficult clients. Right? And that's really helpful. If we, can, if we can know that when somebody walks in the door, that's going to help us figure out how to do things like balance caseloads. Right? You might not want to give one clinician you know, 20 people who all look like that red line. They might be completely overwhelmed. They might not have the time to manage those people. All right, okay, so in that regard, uh, study four was looking at whether or not we could predict change over time. Right? Here, here's the, the big question, right? Are there, are there profiles that don't change? Right? Are there profiles that we might expect don't change, but they do okay? You know, what, what, what do these things tell us? So we got data from about a little bit more than 9,000 students with repeated measures that had been collected over the, course of their, um, over the course of their treatment. And so what we see is we see these awesome differences in the amount of time it takes in terms of sessions and in terms of days um, to, uh, to treat people. And, and you see you know, almost uh, a factor of two between the, the adjustment and significant substance use group and the in crisis group, right? Those are the two groups right here. So just by knowing which group somebody belongs to, you actually know that somebody in that in crisis group is going to be in treatment twice as long as somebody in that, in that other group, right? That's really helpful. And not only that, but these are really stable numbers. Um, you know, they're really, they're really quite well balanced. Um, and so, you know, the, the other major question is, you know, how, how do people do in treatment, right? So, so if we look at this, you know, this is sort of a classic uh, mood disorder profile, right? This is the one I've, I've, I've brought up several times, right? It looks like probably major depressive disorder. And so over the, and they, and they get uh, on average 10 sessions of treatment. And look at that, boom, you know, very nice. The effect size for, for depression, for the depression subscale from pre to post treatment is a 1.28, which is huge. I mean, that's tremendous. It means that college counseling centers with this type of patient, they, they got it covered. You know, they're doing an awesome job. You know, their, their distress is, is really moving across the board where we want it to be moving. And so basically what we can say is that if somebody comes in looking like this, they're probably, you know, they probably meet criteria for major depressive disorder, and you probably can put them into treatment with somebody, you know, with anybody, right? Remember that other study that I showed you that demonstrated that, you know, therapists appear to be, you know, pretty generally good at treating major depressive disorder, right? Whereas when it gets, you know, co-occurring with substance use, it becomes more difficult. Right, so here basically we can say, you know, refer them to you know your next available therapist, and uh, and they'll be able to handle it. Aha. Okay. So now let's look at this group. Right, eating concerns and substance use. Two percent of the, the the sample. Right, dominated by women. Uh, it's it's largely driven by uh, by Caucasian women. Uh, and let's look at change over time for these people. So these this group takes. Uh, about 10 sessions as well, right? 
and let's look at their change over time. So the effect size for eating is a 0.28. Uh, and if we compare that with, oh, I didn't pull in profile nine. Uh, okay, so profile nine has, has identical uh, eating concerns, but no substance use, no co-occurring substance use, and they have an effect size of, of 0.8 in terms of change. Right, so, so what we're seeing here is, here's a group of people who are put into treatment for 10 sessions, and, and they get you know, barely a small effect size change in their eating concerns. And, and when I've shown this to people in college counseling, sort of anecdotally, what they've said is, oh yeah, that makes complete sense. So, so again, you know, this kind of data can be really, really helpful in indicating to us perhaps when somebody ought not be referred to treatment as usual. Maybe you should find a specialist. Maybe you should refer out. But you should probably not just assume that you can refer this person to treatment and just let it be. Because that's probably not going to work out very well based on these data. So that's, that's it. That's the whole thing. Um, so it uh, looks like we have a que uh, not a question but a comment. Eating concerns without family concerns seems strange. You know, it's an, interesting, it's an interesting point, right? But you'll look, right, and you'll note that across the board for these people, they're not reporting a lot of distress, right? Their, their social anxiety, academic distress, depression, right, are all below the average, right? Now, remember that there are, sorry, I'm going to go way back, but it's, it's going to be worth it, I promise. Um, there are, are groups of people, uh, let's see, with, with disordered eating, who are reporting family distress, right? Look at 3 and 13, right? They're both reporting family distress. And so, you know, one of the things that, that these analyses are doing is that they are differentiating between people who, who report, uh, you know, family distress, depression, and anxiety, along with eating and substance use, or along with eating. They're differentiating those people from those who don't report those things. And that's, that's meaningful. I mean, there's a, there's a literature out there that shows that, you know, eating disorders can often be a very effective way of masking other problems, right? And so these people, right, may just be really entrenched in their coping mechanism, right? Disordered eating may be their coping mechanism. Oh, oh, and another really interesting thing, sorry. Um, but another really interesting thing about this profile that differentiates them from the other profiles is that, okay, so when you have eating concerns co-occurring with substance use, you're much, much more likely to get a diagnosis of bulimia. Whereas if you have eating disorder without substance use, you're much more likely to get a di diagnosis of anorexia. And that makes sense because substance use requires the intake of an awful lot of calories. Alcohol has a ton of calories. So if you're a restrictive type eating disorder, you're probably not going to abuse substances. But again, this is sort of a backdoor way of getting at that, which is that by measuring this, the, the amount of substance use, what you're really getting at is caloric intake. And so what you see is that this profile may represent more impulsive, binge eating, uh, you know, white women, whereas other profiles may indicate, you know, women who, uh, who are more restrictive in their, in their eating. Um, so, you know, broadly, just to, to wrap up, you know, these profiles seem to be uh, an effective way of, of doing what, what, what broadly is called risk adjustment, right? The idea is you, you take a bunch of characteristics and you use them to figure out what kind of patient this is, what kind of client is walking in my door, and what can I expect from that. Right? They do this all the time in medicine. Right? They take your blood pressure, they take your heart rate, they measure your respiratory weight, your rate, they take your height and your weight so that they know what your body mass is. Right? And they use these things to predict what your likely health costs are going forward. And we can do the same thing in mental health, and we should be, and it should be driven by clinical psychologists because we have the best skills at, at, at doing this kind of research and this kind of work. Um, so and this is just, you know, sort of summing up exactly what I've been saying before. Intake, triage, tracking change, making administrative decisions. Uh, you know, this kind of, of research, I think, affords us the opportunity to really change the field in a meaningful way and to do it before other people change the field for us.
I think that that, that piece of urgency is one that, that particularly to this audience I would really deliver uh, because change is coming, at least in the United States, it's really coming fast. Um, so I want to say thank you and I want to open this up to any questions. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a real pleasure doing this. Thank you, Sam, for this very interesting talk. Um, let's see if we get some questions here. And if we don't, it just means that I've done an amazing job and, and you know, we can go. <laughs> you did an amazing job regardless of, of getting questions or not. Okay, people, so do you have any questions for Sam based on his talk? Feel free to raise your hand. We're amongst friends. Um, here is Gerhard Zarbok saying thanks a lot. So while we're waiting for questions, let me ask you one, Sam. Um, I've tried a little bit of this latent class uh, models myself, um, but I had some trouble um, finding patterns in my own data, and I have a data set about, of about 1,500 patients. So that should yep. uh, normally uh, give some results. Uh, and it seemed like that uh, yeah. settings are really uh, difficult in these models and in order to sort of get results. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the thing that I really take away is that if I had just been modeling across depression, generalized anxiety, social anxiety, and academic distress, I wouldn't mm -hmm. have found anything. Okay. You know, and I, and I think that that's really important. Um, you know, I, I think that, uh, I, I think that, you know, these models, you know, the other thing we have to be very, very careful of with them is that we don't reify the results, right? I mean, we have to be very careful when clusters or classes emerge, you know, we have to test them. We have to make sure that they actually, that they actually matter. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I don't want to get too, too technical in terms of sort of, you know, model specifications and things like that. But I, I do think that one of the things that can really cause problems is if, you're, if your data are, you know, sort of highly, highly correlated or highly, highly continuously distributed, you know, you have real problems in, uh, in sort of pulling classes because there may not be any, you know, classes that actually sort of help improve the fit of the model. Okay. <clears throat> um, there is some question here. Uh, first of all, Wendy Somerville from the UK says, thank you as somebody in the UK, as someone in the UK, is there non-US data that would suggest these models have applicability to other populations, please? Can you still hear me? I thought I was losing connection. Sam? Sorry, Kim, I had you on mute. <laughs> oh. Uh, okay. Oh. Um, okay. Um, okay. All right, let me, let me. Um, okay. Uh, so. Uh, Can you answer Wendy's okay, question? Non-U.S. data, yes. Yes, there's tons of non-U.S. data. Um, so in the U.K., um, you know, sort of Michael Barkham and his group are collecting a ton of this data on the, the core. Um, and, and so, you know, this kind of data is, is out there. The, the, the core is a pretty widely used uh, instrument and, and one that, uh, you know, they've published a lot on. They haven't done this kind of work on it yet, but, you know, I think it's only a matter of time. The, again, the, the, the thing that I would say that, that seems really important to me is that you want measures to be as, as sort of broadly multidimensional as possible. You want measures to be capturing distress across a wide variety of different domains. Right? So you, again, you know, one of the things that I, that I think you know, sort of I really observe in, in these results uh, is, is that there are continuous distributions that we could possibly model as classes but they're not, they're not very useful. Uh, whereas if we can combine things like distress, 
functional impairment, um, you know, those two in particular, but also, you know, distress in, in, in sort of very different paradigms. Um, I think that that's, that's where we really get, get the best bang for our buck. Um, so, you know, I would love to be able to build profiles that don't just have, you know, self-reported symptoms, but that also carry some measure of, of work functioning, right, social functioning. Uh, I, th I think that those things, those kinds of functional domains would also be really interesting. Um, but anyway, you, you can certainly find this data in the, in the UK. Um, the core is pretty widely used. I see that Chris is here, uh, Chris Evans. Chris, do you want to comment on that? I've opened up your microphone. Um. <laughs> Sorry for putting you on the spot. Caught, caught me off balance there. Um. In some ways, it seems to me the measure that Andrew that you're you using is more multidimensional than core. Um, so I'd certainly be intrigued to see whether we'd get something like this. I was I was going to say something like that, but then I, I decided that I would just sort of withhold, you know, that because I, I think that the core has the advantage of being a bit shorter than the measure that. Uh, that we used here, and, and so you might be able to also, you know, sort of include some other data, because um, I, I know in the UK people are still experimenting a lot with measures of recovery that, that definitely capture some areas of functional impairment. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, sorry. I can leave that one there. <laughs> I'll, I'll close you back up again, Chris. Um, Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Ciro Caro. Um, I'm going to open up your mic right now. Can you ask your question? Um, I wonder if you can uh, explain um, how do you link your conclusions to the issue of um, more qualitatively oriented uh, forms of assessment of change in psychotherapy? Just departing from your conclusions. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question, and I, and I think that um, you know qualitative methods are certainly not an area of expertise for me, uh, but I have a lot of respect for people who have the the patience and the skills to do that kind of work. I think that uh, microprocess or or small outcome uh, psychotherapy process and outcome work is really really important. I think it's important for for different reasons, though, than this work, right? So I think that I think that that work really can help inform the way we think about generating change and the way we think about uh, sort of modifying practice. Whereas these data really, I think, offer us a better sense of sort of what to expect uh, from a particular patient, and and I, I think they're less less sort of granular and less detailed than qualitative research. But what I'd love to see is I'd love to see mixed methods work. I'm actually on a grant with some colleagues in Norway uh, where we're doing exactly that. We're sort of using quantitative session-by-session session measurement to then trigger qualitative interviews. Uh, and so when a particular quantitative event takes place, it's followed up by a qualitative interview to get a sort of a better sense of the microprocess that led to the quantitative change. And I think that work like that's going to be really, really important for us. Thank you. Yes. And then we have a question from Polly Casey. I'm going to open up your microphone right now. Go ahead, Polly. Ah, she Polly says she has no microphone. Um, Polly asks, says, brilliant presentation. Can you do LPA using more than one questionnaire to profile clients. I think of all the subscales yeah. are from the C caps. She said. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and ideally, what you'd want to make sure is you'd want to make sure that your your measures weren't measuring the same constructs more than once. Um, and and but yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could set up your data however you want. You know, I mean, you can include as many dimensions in an LPA as you as you like. Right, so I use the eight subscales, so you can think of that as an eight-dimensional state space. Uh, but you could include 
30, it would just take longer to run, I expect. And, 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 and I expect it would also be harder to interpret, right? Because, because you, you start to run into, uh, you know, real challenges in, in interpreting things as they become more and more complicated, right? So a computer might be able to tell you, hey, this particular profile is meaningfully different from this other one. Uh, but you might look at 30 indicators and have a real hard time figuring out what that means. Um, you also asked, would you need to standardize the scores from different uh, questionnaires? I, I would suggest that you do that. I think it would make your results more interpretable. Um, but you wouldn't have to do it in order for it to run. Um, but but I, would, I would suggest doing that. I think it would make it much easier to interpret what, uh, what your profiles are really capturing. Uh, if I may add to that, I think that if if you were to have sim, uh, several instruments measuring more or less the same construct or having some overlap, you could certainly start perhaps by doing a factor analysis on everything that you have and then, you know, make uh, different sort of new subscales and use them for your profile probably. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. And actually, if you're using, um, you know, if you you know, using SEM and you're using a program like M plus or something, you could actually, I think, do that all in the same model. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are there any other questions? I think that we're done with questions. So, Sam, I want to really thank you for your very interesting talk. And you've done so much work for studies in one dissertation. Wow, that's a lot. Um, also want to um, encourage everybody who is here, like Sam did at the beginning, uh, to consider presenting your own dissertation research uh, in these series. Uh, we are still looking for uh, presenters, and um, and so <clears throat> uh, feel free to email one of us or to uh, meetings at uh, psychotherapyresearch.org um, to uh, you know, sign up for presenting yourself. And with that note, on that note, I want to wrap this up. And thank you. Let's also remind for... people that uh, what November 18th at 12 p.m. Uh, Marv Goldfried will be uh, giving a webinar. Yes, very good point. And that will be on on psychotherapy integration. Yes. And a lot of people have already signed up for that one, so that, uh, we're expecting a great turnout there. And so keep attending to the webinars, and I want to wish you a great rest of your day um, and end on that note. Thank you very much.